Hello everybody, my name is Ran Raz from Princeton University. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Oded Regev from NYU. He is going to talk about the reverse uh, Minkowski theorem. Uh, Oded is very well known for, uh, for results in several different, uh, in several different uh, research areas. In particular, he is very well known for the learning with error problem in cryptography that essentially revolutionized the cryptography uh, and uh, is a very, today is the, like a standard assumption in uh, post uh, quantum uh, cryptography and also uh, based on this assumption uh, people were able to, to give many other cryptographical uh, primitives that were considered to be impossible before. Uh, he's also known for works on uh, quantum computation and uh, on uh, communication complexity and on lattice theory on which he is going to talk about today. Hi everyone, today I'd like to tell you about the project started in 2012 together with uh, Daniel Dadouche and uh, Noah Stefan Davidovitz, uh, where we were considering a certain reverse of Minkowski's theory. So let's get started. The main object we study today uh, are lattices. Lattices are simply the set of all integer combinations of some and linearly independent vectors, v1 up to vn. Uh, or alternatively, they're a discrete subgroup of Rn. So you can see in this example, that is um, generated by the basis v1, v2. So we basically have all the integer combinations, such as 2 times v1, or v1 plus v2, and so on and so forth. So maybe perhaps the most well-known lattices uh, z to the power n, the integer lattice of all integer points in the uh, in n dimensional space. Uh, generally, I should say n will denote the dimension. So uh, this is z to the n, and this very special lattice will play an important role today. Okay, so the history of lattices dates back to the uh, 19th century uh, and even before. Uh, where there was considerable mathematical interest, uh, starting from Lagrange, from Gauss, from Hermit, um, Minkowski. Uh, and Minkowski is the one who um, moved this towards a more geometric view that we, take, that we will take today. Um, initially, most of the interest came from uh, number theoretic questions, for instance, how to express an integer as a sum of four squares. The nowadays the interest uh, spans a wide range of topics. Uh, the interest in lattices comes not only from number theory, but also from sphere packing, geometry of numbers, as I mentioned, but also in computer science, uh, questions like integer programming, computational complexity, cryptography, and even in engineering, um, coding theory, wireless communication. Turns out that lattices show up a lot uh, in cell phone communication and so on, they play an important role there. The focus of today is mainly from the perspective of geometry of numbers, or so sphere packing, uh, trying to understand geometrical properties of uh, lattices. So let's get um, started with one of the perhaps uh, uh, most well-known uh, questions, uh, and that is the question of sphere pack. The question is, how densely can we pack identical spheres in n-dimensional space? Well, in dimension two, the answer is well known. Uh, it's simply the hexagonal packing, which I'm showing here using quarters on my floor. Um, densest packing packs 90.7% of space, uh, or the plane in this case. You can see there are very, uh, only very small gaps left between those coins. Um, this was first shown by two in 1892, and more uh, rigorously by phase dot in uh, 1951. So this is really the densest way to pack spheres in, in two dimensions. 
And let me show this also uh, more uh, graphically here. So there's what you're seeing here are uh, various two-dimensional lattices. And for each one, I'm showing the best packing that we can use as the best sphere packing. So for instance, um, if we're considering the here, this lattice here, this is the hexagonal lattice. And you can see it's quite dense. There are very uh, small gaps left between the spheres. Uh, and if I continue playing, for instance, this one is uh, somewhat worse packing. There's there's lots of gaps left between the spheres. One thing I'd like to demonstrate here is that the radius of the sphere, in this case of the disk, the radius is exactly half of the length of the shortest vector in the lattice, or the shortest non-zero vector, I should say. Okay, so you can see here, uh, this would be the shortest vector in the lattice, and the radius of the spheres that we pack or of the disks is exactly half of the shortest vector. Um, this is to ensure that they don't overlap. Okay, so uh, this is the sphere packing question in two dimensions. So moving on to three dimensions, the best packing um, was for many years believed to be this one. It's known as a face centered cubic. Uh, it was conjectured to be the densest ordi by Kepler in 1611. Uh, the density it, achieve, it achieves is 74%. So the, it only leaves 26% uh, gaps between the spheres. Gauss was the first to show that this is indeed densest, but only among lattice packings, only if you really only consider lattices like we would do today. But if you consider other packings that perhaps do not form a lattice, this required a very difficult proof, and this was shown by Hales uh, in 1998 first, and then in 2014 using uh, computer-verified proofs. Um, this is something he presented here uh, in this conference 20 years ago. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional three case, but recently, in recent years, there's been progress also in higher-dimensional cases, specifically in A dimensions, where Vyazovka, uh, she showed that E8, uh, is the densest lattice. It's, uh, it's a very dense lattice in, in eight dimensional space. Uh, and later, together with Kahn, Kumar, Miller, and Rochenko, um, Vyazovska also showed uh, the 24 dimensional uh, leech lattice is the densest in, in 24 dimensional space. So, before moving on, I'd like to define the sphere packing question more uh, formally because that would help us with. Uh, our question. So for that, I need to define something called determinant. So what is determinant? The well, determinant is simply the volume occupied per lattice point. So to make this more precise, one thing we can do, we can take a sphere for radius r and count the number of points in a sphere and then let r go to infinity. So take bigger and bigger r and basically what you get at the end, you get some idea of the number of points uh, per volume or the volume per lattice point. So formally what we do, we define the determinant as the limit as this radius goes to infinity of the volume of the ball divided by the number of lattice points inside the ball. Okay, So this is the cardinality of lattice intersected with the ball of radius r. So this is called determinant because it happens to also be the absolute value of the determinant of the, of the you know, matrix uh, whose columns are the, um, the basis of lattice. So determinant is basically some way of measuring the density of lattice uh, or the global density, the number of points per, uh, you know, per, per uh, volume of space. So determinant, I want to think of it as some kind of sy asymptotic density or some global density of lattice. So it's a volume per that point. And now that we have this very basic definition of the determinant, we can go on and, and define the packing density, the thing we were discussing before for sphere packing. So what is packing density? Well, it's simply the volume of those spheres that we can pack. So those are balls of, of um, radius lambda L over two. Lambda here is the length of the shortest vector in the lattice, or, or the shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. 
and we divide by the determinant of L, which is the volume occupied by, by each lattice point. So this quotient here, this is basic. This is the fraction of space uh, that's occupied by the spheres, by the balls. So this sphere packing question really asks to maximize that portion, this portion. And you know, by scaling, because scaling doesn't really matter, you can scale the lattice you know, up or down, it doesn't change the fraction of uh, space that's occupied by the spheres. So by scaling, you can easily show that maximizing this quotient over all lattices is the same as simply maximizing the volume of that uh, ball that we can pack only over lattices of determinant one. So we can restrict without loss of generality to lattices of determinant one just by scaling. So this is a sphere packing question. Again, just maximizing the volume of the ball of radius lambda L over two, lambda being the length of the shortest non-zero vector, uh, and maximizing it over all lattices of determinant one. So that's, that's the classical sphere packing question. So one thing we can easily see, we tell is that this density, this packing density, can never be bigger than one, right? Because you cannot occupy more than 100% of space. So clearly, this is at most one. And well, why am I saying this? Because um, you can easily see, can, one can easily show that the volume of a ball in n dimensions of radius squared n over 2 is bigger than one. So once you take a ball of radius squared on over two, the volume is already bigger than one. And if you, don't, if you don't know this, you can easily prove it because such a ball contains the cube minus half comma half to the power n. So this cube of side length one is contained inside this ball of radius squared to squared n over two. And as a result, the volume of the ball is bigger than the volume of the cube, but the volume of the cube is one. So the volume of the ball is also bigger than one. So since the volume of this ball of radius squared n over two is bigger than one, we get that the largest uh, uh, lambda of L, the largest, uh, the shortest vector can be is at most square root n. Because here you couldn't get a ball of radius bigger than square root n over two, because that would already make this maximum bigger than one. So we know that the biggest that lambda of L can be, the biggest that this radius can be, is at most square root n, right? because otherwise it would contradict the fact that the density is at most one. So what we just proved is basically Minkowski's theorem. So this is the uh, simplest form of Minkowski's theorem, telling us that in any lattice of determinant one, lambda l, or the length of the shortest non-zero vector, is at most square root n. Or in other words, in any lattice of determinant one, there must exist a non-zero vector of norm at most square root n. And again, this is basically Minkowski's theorem in its simplest form. Okay. So the theorem again says that for any L with determinant equals one, for any lattice in, the, in dimension n with determinant being one, the number of lattice points in the ball of radius square root n is at least two. Okay. So there's the origin, origin is always there. But in addition, there's at least one extra point. Okay, so this is Minkowski's theorem in its most basic form. Uh, in fact, you can easily use the same proof, uh, same proof and proof is slightly uh, some stronger lower bound. This was done by uh, Blickfeld and uh, von der Korput in 1936. What they showed is that for this radius, for instance, you actually get many more points. You get exponentially many points. You can get two to the n points, for instance. Uh, if you get, uh, if you count the number of points in a ball of radius square. So there's ex there are exponentially many points, and in fact, and not just two. So this is Minkowski's theorem in, in a more general form. Um, and this basically is a starting point of, of our uh, project. The thing we can, su we can summarize Minkowski's theorem as saying that if you know something about the global density, in the sense of the determinant being one, in the sense of the number of points per volume. So if you know something about that, you know the determinant is one, it also tells you something in a more local fashion, in a more local way about points inside the small ball around the origin. So one way to 
maybe summarize it here with saying something about something like global density implies local density. And here I mean global and local, not in the sense of number theory, but in the sense of global is asymptotic and local is in the small regions around the origin. So this is Minkowski's theorem, and this led uh, the douche to ask the following question. And the douche was looking for a converse to Minkowski's theorem. Um, so 10 years ago, he you know, came and asked, can we prove something in, 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 the, in the reverse form? Can we show that local density, or having, having many points in the ball, having a locally dense region, many points in the ball, does that mean also something about the global properties of lands, about global density, about the term? So before I state this more precisely, let me try to motivate it by a couple of examples. And let's start with this following very naive question. What is the largest number of points that a lattice can have in a ball of radius square root n? So we take a ball, in this case uh, of radius uh, square root 2, and we ask what's the largest, largest number of points that lattice can have there? Well, so obviously, if you think about this, this doesn't really make sense. The number of points can be as large as you wish, right? I can always take denser, denser, and denser lattices. So obviously, this portion doesn't make sense, uh, and we have to normalize somehow, right? So we obviously have to normalize. So to prevent such cases where the lattice becomes arbitrarily dense, let's assume the term is 1. And this is for the same reason that Minkowski has to assume the term is one. So we need to normalize somehow. But turns out that this is actually not enough. Turns out that even if you take a lattice of determinant one, even if you restrict to determinant one, you can still have arbitrarily large number of points in a ball of radius square root n. And the reason is actually quite simple. Here's why. By Condensing the x-axis and expanding the y-axis, I'm generating here lattices that have arbitrarily many points inside the ball of radius square root n, and yet they all have determinant 1. The reason is because they're much denser on the x-axis, but much sparse on the y-axis, so the determinant is actually still 1, but those lattices can contain arbitrarily many points inside the border of the square root n. So let's, let's just see this again. We're getting denser and denser. Uh, or determinant is still 1, but inside the ball uh, of, of radius square root n, we get more and more points, or the local density increases there. OK, so how do we make sense of this? Turns out to avoid just such things, it seems that what we need to prevent, we need to prevent not just the lattice of determinant uh, less than one, but we also have to make sure that inside the sublattice, and this is what we're seeing here in the x-axis, we want to make sure that also sublattices have determinant at least one. And this is really uh, the way we want to phrase the question. We want to also assume that all sublattices have determinant at least one. That we don't get things like that here, where there's a subspace, where inside the subspace, we have a dense lattice in, in the sense of determinant less than one. So let's try to make this all more precise. And here is really what the main theorem is about. The main theorem gives an upper bound to the number of points inside the ball of radius square root n. And it assumes something about the determinants, not only of the lattice itself, but also of all the sub lattices. So, the main theorem for a radius square root n will later have a more general form. The main theorem, uh, including improvements by Dadouche, says the following. If you have a lattice n and all sublattices have determinant at least one, okay, so there's never a sublattice of determinant less than one, there's never a sublattice that's dense, then we have a bound of e to the cn for some constant c. On the number of points of norm at most square root n, or at most c times square root n for some constant c. So, equivalently, the main theorem tells you that if you have a lattice and it has 
too many points. It has many points inside the ball of radius square root n. It has exponentially many points inside the ball. The theorem tells you that there must be an explanation. There must be a sub lattice or if you wish, a subspace where inside that sub lattice, the determinant is less than one. Okay. There is a reason that you can really uh, see in terms of determinants. Determinants can explain why you might have, why you have more than exponentially many points inside the ball of radius square root n. So this is the main theorem. This is a special case, or this is a specific case for the radius of square root n. Let me move on to the uh, next form, which is the case of all radii. So this is the more general form of the theorem. And here we address the case of all radii. So the theorem in this form says that if all sub lattices have the terminal at least one, as before, then in fact for all R, not just square root n, you have a bound on the number of points. So previously the bound was simply uh, exponential in n. Here we have this extra log squared factor. So here what we get is that the number of points of norm at most r, again, if we assume some bound on the sub lattice determinants, that all of them are at least one, then you get a bound of e to the log squared n times r squared. So exponential in log squared n times r squared. So this log uh, we lose here is actually uh, partly necessary. It turns out that if you consider again the z to the n, this integer lattice that I mentioned before, this is actually near the time. Because in z to the n, the number of points of norm at most r is actually quite large. It's actually at least n to the uh, n choose r squared, which is exponential in c log n times r squared. So you see that up to this log versus log squared, this bound is actually uh, tight. So the upper bound is, has a log squared, the lower bound has log n, but it's nearly tight. Now, where is this coming from? Let me just explain. If you consider z to the n, and you consider, say, all 0, 1 vectors, you have n choose r squared vectors that contain r squared ones, that have Hamming-weight r squared. Those vectors have L2 norm, right, Euclidean norm, at most r. This is why we're getting this n choose r squared. And I should have said that r is less than square root of n here. So this applies only up to square root n. Up to square root n, you get a different expression and there are diff different bounds. OK. So this is the main theorem in the more uh, general form. Now, I, I should at this point pause and, and ask, you know, why do we care? And the reason we care is because there are many applications. Um, and many of them are, uh, were uh, shown in a uh, paper with Dadouche. And one of the main applications is resolving uh, a special case of a conjecture by Kanan, Kanan and Lovas from 1988. Um, they were interested in a parameter called the covering radius, the covering radius of lattice. And they were con conjecturing there is a way to characterize the covering radius in terms of determinants of sub lattices. And this is really what we show. We show that you can indeed achieve that. You can get a characterization of the covering radius in terms of sub lattice determinants. Um, the motivation for that came from integer programming, from computer science, but it's a purely mathematical question. Um, and we can uh, answer that question so we can prove that conjecture in a special case of Euclidean norm, the case of L2 norms. Um, the uh, other applications come from computer science, computation complexity of lattice problems, we obtain some NP certificate for having many short lattice points. Um, and if you know about these things, you can guess that the certificate is in the form of a subspace, a subspace that has a low determinant, as a sub lattice of low determinant. The reason this is possible is because the determinant is efficiently computable. So by giving you a subspace and showing you that there is a low determinant there, you can easily verify this. That's why we get NP certificates. Um, we also get applications to hardness reductions in, in cryptography. Um, 
Another application is the equation of uh, cell of cost, who asked about the behavior of Brownian motion on flat tori. Um, and he was specifically asking about the connection between L1 mixing time and L infinity mixing time. And we can answer that question um, in, this, in this case. Um, to demonstrate this question, I'll just show it um, a uh, short uh, uh, animation of this. Basically, sort of course, asked what happens when you take kind of a Brownian motion around the lattice, around the flat doors, the same thing. And this is what happens after uh, a little bit of time. And after a bit more time, it looks like that. And if you continue the Brownian motion, it might look like that. And at some point, it starts mixing. And then you get this flat uh, uniform distribution. And Sal, of course, asked if the mixing time in L1 is similar to the mixing time in L infinity. And so it turns out that this is really the case. And this falls from uh, what we show here. More applications. Um, with uh, Shahar Lovet, we showed a counterexample to a very strong variant of Fry Maguja conjecture over the integers. This is a question that Ben Green asked. Um, and uh, has, as, he, uh, as he expected, there is a counterexample which, which we found there um, using the reverse Minkowski theorem. Other uh, applications are, again, to computational complexity. So computational proof systems for lattice problems. Um, the do showed connections with a slicing conjecture um, from high dimensional geometry. Um, and finally, what we're showing here could possibly have, uh, could be an approach to a certain conjecture by Binkowski that I will not describe today. Um, and this is um, due to work by Shapira and Weiss. Okay, so what I'd like to do now after presenting those applications, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the proof, just to give you a sense of how we prove such a theorem. Um, and let me first remind you what the main theorem is, the thing we're trying to prove. So what we want to show is that for, if for all the sublattices of L, the determinant is at least one, then for any radius R, L has at most e to the c log squared and r squared points of normatmost r. So there's a bound on the number of points of normatmost r, number of points in the ball of radius r. What we will show will show uh, actually a stronger statement. Instead of counting points in the ball, it's much nicer to work with this function, the raw t function that we define here. So let me describe this. What we want to prove is, is a certain Gaussian, or if you wish, sometimes it's called a theta function, uh, form of this main theorem. And it immediately implies the main theorem. So let's see what, what we really want to prove is this. So again, we assume that all sub lattices have determined at least one. And we want to show that this functional here, this rho t of L, is at most two. So what is rho t of L? Rho t of L is simply a sum of of the Gaussian mass uh, on the lattice L. So it's a sum of all x and L of e to the negative t squared norm of x squared. And, and t is just some constant times log L. So we're basically giving to each point, it's a weighted sum uh, over lattice points, as opposed to here, which was summing over an indicator of a ball. Like, you know, norm the most r is, is weight one, and norm bigger than r is weight zero. Here we have a weighted sum. So each point gets this, contrib contributes this, this amount to the sum. This is the weight of each point. And once you prove this bound, that this functional is at most two, it immediately follows that the number of points of norm at most r is at most this, because each point contributes to the sum, the reciprocal of this number. So there can be at most that many points. Um, inside a ball of norm R, because the points inside the ball contribute too much to that sum otherwise. Okay. So this is really what we want to focus on, the main theorem. This is the main theorem. And how do we prove it? So we use a proof structure that uh, comes from a paper of Shapira and Weiss. Uh, and for simplicity, for today, let me assume that 
the determinant of L is exactly one. The way I stated it here, the determinant of L could be potentially bigger than one. We just need all determinants to be at least one. For simplicity today, let me just assume that the determinant is exactly one. The general proof is uh, needs, needs a couple more steps, but it's similar. The main idea is all here. So once the determinant of L is exactly one, we can now consider the following set. We can consider a set that's known as a set of stable lattices. Sometimes it's called stable. And it's basically, it's simply all lattices L of determinant one having the property that all their sub-lattices have determined at least one. So this is exactly the set we care about, those, those lattices of determinant one, all of whose sub-lattices have determined at least one. And this is a compact set. And our goal is precisely to bound, to bound this functional row T on the set of stable lattices. Okay. So I should say the set um, comes from work of uh, Harder and Nar Simhan um, in the late 70s and, and of Stuhle um, and later of Grayson. So this set actually um, comes from working with that. This, this concept of stable stability, semi-stable, comes from algebraic geometry. Uh, and and this, what we're using here is using just this definition uh, of this set of stable lattices. Um, so this is, again, a compact set. And all we need to do, all the main theorem is about, is just bounding a certain functional. We just want to bound this functional on the set. And what I'm drawing here is just a cartoon version of the set of stable lattices. So it's a compact set, and we want to bound a certain functional on the set. So again, just to emphasize, this is a set of stable lattices, and each point here is a lattice. So for instance, this one maybe is, is z to the n, is the, is the lattice integer points. Okay, so how do we bound a function on a set? Well, um, there are two cases to consider. The first case is that the maximum of this functional happens to be on the boundary. So what I'm showing you here is uh, color coding uh, uh, of, of the functional on the set. So white means low and, and, and dark black means high. And maybe the maximum is achieved here on the boundary. Okay? So this is case one where this maximum is achieved on the boundary. So I have this set, I have this lattice here, L dagger, and that achieves the maximum. So let's kind of zoom in and see what, this, what is this lattice where, you know, it's some lattice, right? And it's on the boundary. But let's think for a minute, what does it actually mean for a lattice to be on the boundary of the set, right? So we have all those inequalities here. The inequalities that says that say that the sub lattices have determined at least one. And if we're the boundary, kind of by definition, it means that there exists a sub lattice L prime of determinant exactly one by definition. So it means that here, if this is L dagger, it means there is some sub lattice, some subspace where the determinant of the sub lattice is exactly one. So maybe this is the one here. There is some L prime where the term is exactly one, kind of by definition of the set. This is what it means to be on the boundary. So why is this interesting? Because now what we'll do is the following step. So watch carefully. What we're doing now is orthogonalizing L. So watch carefully. So what we're doing, we're basically replacing L with some kind of direct sum of L prime and the projection on the orthogonal subspace. So what we did now, we have the projection on the orthogonal subspace. It's the quotient of L dagger by L prime. Okay? So again, just to emphasize L prime in this two dimensional example, because it's in two dimensions, L prime is one dimensional, but Generally, L prime can be k dimensional for any k between 1 and n minus 1. And what we're doing is basically orthogonalizing, replacing L dagger with direct sum of two lattices, one of dimension k and the other of dimension n minus k. Um, mathematically, what we're doing um, can be written uh, as the following. So, what we do, we take L dagger and we replace it by direct sum of L prime with 
health dagger or for health crime. What we're using crucially, and this is this inequality here, which is, well, I'm not showing it today, but it's not very difficult to prove. We're using in this inequality the fact that doing this orthogonalization can only increase the function. And remember, our goal is to bound it from above. So if we can increase, only increase the function, it suffices to now upper bound or bound from above this functional on this direct sum. And because it's direct sum and because of properties of this nice functional, this Gaussian mass, this we can write as a product of two functionals, one on L prime, so the, this row of L prime and row of the L dagger over L prime of the orthogonal component. In, a sen in essence, what we just did here, we reduced the problem to a lower dimensional problem. It started from n dimensional problem and we reduced it to k and n minus k dimensional problems. And now we can basically continue by induction to say that we have already an upper bound on these two terms and we can just you know, multiply that and get a bound on what we care. So this is case one. If we're on the boundary, we can decompose the lattice basically into lower dimensional lattices and continue by induction. Case two is when the maximum happens to be in the interior. Again, we don't know really where the maximum is. We're trying to bound it from above. We don't really understand it. It's a complex function. And we don't know where it is. It's a complicated function. So if it's in the interior, what we can say, though, is that it must be local maximum, right? If we have maximum achieved in the interior of a compact set, it must be a local maximum. In other words, it tells us that the gradient at this point must be zero because it's a local maximum. And now we can use basically calculus. We can say, if we know that the gradient of, this, of the function rho t at that point at dagger is zero, Maybe we can learn something, some properties of a dagger, because we know that the gradient of this function is zero. And this is essentially what we do. We use this information, the fact that the gradient is zero, to derive some upper bound on rho t of a dagger, because we know something about the behavior of a dagger. This step is the most non-trivial. Um, so let me just say a couple, more, a couple more words about how we actually do this step. So, in order to bound the local maxima, we first have to replace rho t with a proxy for rho t, a different function that luckily is close, is very close to rho t, but it's not rho t. The function we use is the Gaussian measure of the Voronoi cell. This turns out to be a good proxy for rho t. So if we can bound the Gaussian measure of the Voronoi cell, we also get a bound on rho t. And that's really what we do. So instead of working with rho t, we actually work with the Gaussian measure of the Voronoi cell. And at this point, we import some heavy hammers from convex geometry. We use the L position. This comes from work of um, Figiel and Tomczak Jägerman and Louis Pizier. And we also use um, the work on the B conjecture by Codero, Eroska, Fredelisi, and Moore. Together with all these tools, we're able to analyze local maxima and get a bound on the Gaussian measure of the Voronoi cell. Let me mention that we also have to modify the first part, the part where the maximum happens to be on the boundary, because now we're using a different functional, using the Gaussian measure of the Voronoi cell and not the function rho t. But luckily, the same trick with the orthogonalization also works for the Gaussian measure of the normal cell. So this concludes the short summary uh, of the proof. And let me basically summarize what we've shown today. So Minkowski's theorem gives lower bounds, gives a lower bound on the number of lattice points in the ball. Um, it says that if you know something about the terminant, you know that there must be many points inside large enough balls. Um, and, and what we did today is we talked about the reverse form of that. We, the reverse form, we give upper bounds. We show that you cannot have too many points inside the ball, assuming that determinants behave in a reasonable way, assuming that no determinant is too small. 
no determinant of sublet is, is too small. So you see that this reverse Minkowski star theorem is tries to tell us that we cannot have too many points inside the ball. And it's not only about the number of points, it's also, as we show in the, in the paper, and, and, and you can see it also in the uh, accompanying uh, review paper for the conference, you can you also apply similar ideas to talk about covering radius or other lattice parameters, not just number of points um, inside the ball. So indeed, much of the lattice literature is about finding base lattices in some sense, base packing, base covering, and so on. This is where you get all those nice, highly symmetric lattices, like the Leach lattice or E8 that I mentioned before. And what we're doing here is, in some sense, like backwards. It's all, it's all uh, trying to find the worst lattices. Okay, we're trying to find the lattice that's the worst packing, that has the most number of points inside the ball, or the worst, worst covering. And it seems that in those cases, like what we talked about today, those, those reverse Minkowski, it seems that the worst examples are actually lattices like Z to the N. Z to the N is actually, as far as we know, um, the maximizer for, for those functionals, for many of those functionals. And this really brings me to the uh, main open question, which is, what is really the worst lattice? What is the densest lattice? Is, that, is it really z to the n? So let me make it more precise. Um, one way to make this precise is to ask, is it true that for all t bigger than zero uh, and all uh, lattices that, that have the terminant of sub lattice at least one, so all, all the sub lattices have the terminant at least one, is it true that the rho t functional is at most that of z to the n. In other words, is z to the n the maximizer of that functional rho t? And as far as you know, this might be true, you not know, prove it. What we proved is uh, something similar to that, but it's not as tight. It's not exactly this inequality. We don't know if z to the n is really the maximizer. So this is the main open question. Um, the only small observation uh, uh, I, I can mention about this is that if this is true, if indeed z to the n is a maximizer of the functional rho t, it also implies z to the n is a maximizer of something known as the Epstein zeta function. So the Epstein zeta function is defined as follows. It's a sum of all points in the lattice of the norm to the power negative 2s, where s is some parameter bigger than dimension over two, bigger than n over two. So this turns out to be an easy corollary of that open, of that question. So if the question is true, we also get that z to the n has to maximize the Epstein zeta function. And, and this was actually recently proven um, in work with Eisenberg and Stefan Davidovich. So we, we do know that z to the n is maximizer of the Epstein zeta function, and maybe this gives some indication that this question might have a positive answer, but again, we still don't know if this is really the case. Great. So thank you. I will stop there and uh, take any questions.